Hey you guys, Lost Profit here. There's no sponsor today, but if you still want to help support the channel, we'll be streaming live over on Twitch, including right after this very video premiere. We stream multiple nights a week, tend to play lots of Dead by Daylight, and there are other spooky games in the pipeline for us to play. So, if you need something to watch between videos, we've got you covered. Plus, check out the channel interactivity. Ever wanted to mess with the streamer's sound or visuals? Now's your chance. You'll find the channel link in the description below. Come give us a follow and join us for some live craziness. And now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. He was playing with Pom Pom and Chucky, and they was having a good old time. I could hear him yelling and they knocked on the door, and there's my brother in the sheets with these kids. I says, brother, I'm gonna teach you how to play pool this morning. I lied to my brother. <laughs> on his last day, freedom. Oh God. What will my neighbors think? Will they think that I'm a bad person, that we're bad people? Um, what will my mother think? Film can be a medium that conveys a number of ideas, and today we're going to be talking about some of the most disturbing and controversial animated films ever to be made. But what happens when an idea is too taboo? not fit for the mainstream or so controversial that its mere existence is considered to be a danger to society. Well, that's what so many groups like One Million Moms and the American Family Association have said in order to pressure politicians and theaters into hiding and limiting the exposure of these truly impactful media. Over time, what we consider right and wrong changes at least a little bit, and what was okay in the 50s to do is no longer acceptable in 2020. Today we'll be cataloging some of these controversial films and taking a look at exactly why they make us feel so uncomfortable. As a direct result of censorship and the tightening of the movie guidelines in the early 2000s, many of the films we're going to be discussing today either cover foreign films or were produced before that year. So with that said, why don't you sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to be scared. These are some of the most controversial and admittedly disturbing animated films ever made. Remember how you felt watching the first few moments of Pixar's Up? Seeing Carl and Ellie live their lives together in brief snapshots, only for Ellie to sadly fall ill and pass away before Carl can make their dream come true? Well, take that sequence and its associated feels, and then stretch them out over the length of an entire film, making sure that the concept of a happy ending is, both metaphorically and literally, burned from existence. Welcome to the brutally emotional experience that is when the wind blows. Out in the British countryside, our protagonists, Jim and Hilda Bloggs, at first appear to be your typical older couple. They've had a child, they've lived through the horrors of the Second World War, and now they're faced with the haunting rumor of an impending nuclear strike. Using the experience they shared through the war, they do everything they can to hunker down and deal with this new and harrowing threat just as they have before. During the war, Jim and Hilda put quite a bit of faith in their government, and they had pulled through for the most part, even through the Blitz. They followed the instructions on the state-issued Protect and Survive pamphlets, having no reason to believe things would be any different this time. And then, it happens. The history of their world deviates from our own in the worst way imaginable. The couple manages to survive the initial bombing, which is depicted through a truly surreal and unsettling mixture of pencil sketch, stop motion, and traditional animation. And though they've done everything their pamphlets have asked of them, they can't escape the invisible killer, radiation. 
that's already sealed their fate. Their resolve, however, keeps their unknowingly dashed hopes alive, as Jim expresses faith that if they just hold out a little longer, things will be all right. Heeding government instructions to await rescue, the couple continue to remain in the ruins of their home, but they can't stop the inevitable. Withering and growing weaker as supplies start running dry and despair starts setting in. Eventually, Jim and Hilda both find themselves bedridden. It's then that they come to the grim realization. Help isn't coming. It never was. Sorry if you were expecting something of a happier ending, even despite the onset of a nuclear annihilation. Despite being animated, Waltz with Bashir is actually a documentary about filmmaker Arif Fullman who goes around talking to his therapist and friends to figure out what happened when he was 19 as an infantry soldier during the 1982 Lebanon War, a moment in his life that he completely lost all memory about. Throughout Fullman's journey, he interviews several of his past comrades about some of their experience during the war many of which were so close to death and had to rely either on their wits or pure luck to come out alive. While these stories were quite shocking to watch, the true power of the movie comes from what it actually is. Like I said, it may be animated where the visuals depict the moments that the veterans tell, but this is a documentary. All these stories that are told in the film are events that did happen in real life by the people who experienced them painting a grim reality of what happened during the Lebanon War and how casualties from innocent people were unfortunately commonplace. But the more Fullman recollects his memory, the more he discovers that those memories were not forgotten, but rather suppressed by his own trauma. You see, Fullman wasn't just a soldier during the Lebanon War. Specifically, he's trying to recollect his memory when he was in the army during the Sabra and Shatila massacre. This was a time when the Christian Milita Lebanese, also known as Phalangists, reportedly killed numerous of Palestinians in refugee camps, to which the count is said to be either in the hundreds or in the thousands. Even if Fulman never directly killed any of the people at the time, the reason he forgot was because his mind was just saving him from the guilt of helping the death of many innocent lives caused by political revenge, since the Phalangists mistakenly thought the Palestinians were responsible for the assassination of then newly elected Bashir Jemayel. And to really sell the point across, the movie concludes with switching the animation to real footage of the aftermath with widows mourning and bodies all piled up in the streets. Regardless if they're young or old, this is what the true face of war looks like. Not a proud soldier fighting for their country, but a dead kid who was sacrificed in the name of political violence. I originally saw this film back in 2014 when I still narrated for Tats Tops videos. For those who even remember, it was actually Kenshin Mizuhara who recommended it. He said it was the most disturbing movie he had ever seen. And after watching it, I can see why. Six years later, I've only seen the movie once. And even though the animation is bad and the voice acting is laughable, the ideas they try to convey, as Animat put it in his review, could only be described as unholy. And that goes for both the general aesthetic of the movie, as well as the kinds of things it tries to depict. That said, the creation of this film is something that I actually do admire. Shortly after high school, Jimmy Screamer Claus resolved to make his own animated film with zero experience under his belt. So using Maya, Adobe Premiere, and I shit you not a Xbox 360 Kinect, he spent about half a decade making this shocking piece of media. Where the Dead Go to Die is an anthology film with three stories that ultimately share the same themes of excessive abuse, depravity, and what to this day I can only describe as psychedelic Satanism, which Screamer Claus is credited to his daily use of marijuana and previous use of psilocybin mushrooms and LSD. The first story, titled 
Tainted Milk was originally supposed to be a dark parody of Lassie and actually featured a laugh track and everything. But after the animations came out, Jimmy decided that he wanted to take it in a much darker direction. I won't say that anything that happens in this movie is justified in any sense of the term, or that Where the Dead Go to Die is a underrated gem that you need to go check out. Even while trying to write this, I feel incredibly uncomfortable. Even though this movie was created in large part due to one person, which I want to reiterate is commendable, overall it's incredibly hard to watch due to the voice acting, audio leveling, and consistent and extremely graphic concepts that the bad animation tries to present. If there's any redeeming qualities, I'd say it's the psychedelic scenes. The fact that there's a seed of truth to them, in the sense that these scenes are based on actual nightmares that Jimmy had under the influence of LSD, makes the whole cacophony of noise more understandable, yet uncomfortable. Sometimes he posts these shorts and they're just scenes like that and they're pretty entertaining, but most of the time it's actually just hellish visuals that I wish I could unsee. Again, search at your own risk. If any of this sounded interesting to you, there is something that Jimmy made that I can kind of tentatively recommend, and that's When Blackbirds Fly. This film doubles down on the criticism of religion and opts to tell an actual story where the focus is on what he's good at creepy as hell, surreal imagery, and janky animation. One thing I want to end this on is this. Even though I've only seen this movie once, six years ago, it still somehow occupies my thoughts every now and again. And with how messed up this movie actually is, I can't think of anything more disturbing than that. Many of you have heard Ron Perlman say those iconic lines many, many times. War. War never changes. And it's not just the first lines of dialogue that introduce us to nearly every chapter of a post-nuclear horror story. It's true in our world, too. War does not indeed change, only the ways we wage it. Throughout its history, mankind has initiated some particularly gruesome, horrific, and often pointless wars but none of them could compare to the modern horror of World War II. I know it's difficult for some generations to think of it as a modern war, since it was fought relatively long ago. Even my generation has at least 20 years of disconnect from it, and sadly, it's really easy to want to turn such a conflict into nothing more than a collection of statistics. Statistics that belay the personal cost of the war on both sides. Yes, there are indeed two sides to every war, and the 1988 Studio Ghibli classic Grave of the Fireflies gives us a much needed, if not absolutely grim, picture of these personal costs in no uncertain terms. Imagine being thrust into a world where, no matter what you do to survive, there's quite literally nothing you can do to prevent the inevitable, horrible end that awaits you and the people you love. Such is the reality for a teenage boy named Seta, whom we are introduced to as he slowly starves to death in a train station. The remainder of our sad story is told as a flashback. Just a few months earlier, the home Seta shared with his sister Setsuko is destroyed during the bombing of their hometown, Kobe. They survive, but their mother is unfortunately burned to death, and the two are forced to move in with a distant and highly abusive aunt. After retrieving a cache of supplies he buried, he gives it all to his aunt, less a tin of Sakuma drops, and the aunt, in her greed, forces Seta to sell his mother's silk kimono to help pay for the growing refugee crisis in their home. Eventually, the siblings run away to an abandoned bomb shelter, a place that will unfortunately end up killing them both in the end. Sometimes, no matter how good our intentions, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we fight, Sometimes, even if we make all the right decisions, everything can end in the worst ways imaginable. It's this grim realism, coupled with the Studio Ghibli visuals and absolutely immersive soundtrack, that make Grave of the Fireflies stand out as more than deserving of the accolades it's received over the years since its release. And for an event as horrifying as the last Great World War, even with decades of disconnect from the two-front nightmare that it was, 
it provides a much needed, if not brutal, humanization of a side of the conflict that most outside of Imperial Japan would have never otherwise seen. Despite the seemingly child-friendly visuals and the Disney level of animation, Felidae is not for children. This talking cat film is actually a murder mystery filled with cat sex, mutilation, and animal cruelty. The plot follows Francis, an intelligent and curious cat as he investigates a series of feline murders that get increasingly gruesome as the killings continue. Throughout the film, Francis gets these cryptic and surreal dreams about these men in lab coats and horrific hellscapes covered in a sea of dead cats. This eventually leads him to finding a mysterious cult centered around the purification of lesser breeds that don't adhere to the standards of the Egyptian cats that came before. Eventually, it's learned that the mastermind behind the murders wants to overthrow the human race through the use of these genetically superior creations. The cat itself was a test subject that was heavily experimented on. These experiments, much like with the murder scenes, are very hard to watch as the sufferings feel visceral and the aftermath could make the current Mortal Kombat look child-friendly. The mystery focuses a lot on genetics and cat love, as all the cats that were murdered were targeted because of their breed. It invokes World War II imagery, especially on the scientific end, and ultimately leaves us with a shocking film that uses real-world violence and ideology as the motive for the villain. Under most circumstances, a dog filling the role of protagonist for a kid's movie is guaranteed a happy ending. Filmmakers tend to treat the feelings of children delicately and do their best to keep that in mind. Conversely, the 1982 MGM animated film Plague Dogs makes the suffering of the animal protagonists its focal point, showcasing the circumstances that can force a loyal pet to revert to natural instinct. It's a harsh criticism of the experiments performed through vivisection and animal testing for its own sake, bringing these cruelties to light and following them to their logical conclusion. Plague Dogs is written from the perspective of animals, wild animals, working animals, companions, and test subjects alike. It begins at an animal testing facility within a British national park, creating a juxtaposition between the conservative efforts of the park and the cruelty enacted on the animals within its borders. And our own protagonist, Ralph, is drowned over and over again in this horrifying display, all so they can figure out if he can hold his breath longer over successive tests. And Skitters seems to have something done to his brain that causes seizures and bouts of momentary blindness. And of course, being dogs, they can't read or even understand what's happening, which ultimately leads to a few close calls. Even though Ralph and Snitters are able to escape the facility, the testing has left them distrustful of humans and unable to find suitable homes for themselves. The film constantly reminds us of the traumas that linger in their minds, forming the basis of the logic that the dogs use to decide their next course of action, often leaving them even worse off in the long term than they would have been otherwise. The havoc the dogs cause eventually evolves into catastrophe, when a human is accidentally killed trying to recover the animals and cover up the negligence and cruelty the organization had carried out during the testing. This unfortunately seals the fate of Snitters and Ralph when it's revealed that they also may have become infected with a plague while escaping the facility presenting a risk of infection to not only the land and its livestock, but to humans living off of it. Most dogs are guaranteed a happy ending in these kids' films, but plague dogs, there's only one thing that's guaranteed, and it's suffering. There can be no happy ending, and struggling, as seen in this film, will only prolong that misery. Throughout the film, Ralph is absolutely terrified of water for obvious reasons, and it becomes a constant obstacle that he has to overcome. Eventually, after being pinned between the ocean and the British military, Ralph and Snitters are presented with only one real option. Try to find an island and swim away. This fate that Ralph had tried to avoid his entire film debut 
ultimately becomes the thing that kills him. The thing that he feared the most. A slow, painful, suffocating end in a watery grave. This is Plague Dogs. Legendary puppeteer, the late Jim Henson, didn't think it was okay to create an entirely safe, happy world for children's media. Muppet performer Frank Oz once said of his former employer and friend, he thought it was fine to scare children. He didn't think it was healthy for children to always feel safe. This philosophy would lead Henson to create The Dark Crystal, which would join a surprisingly large list of films that would make up the darker side of my own childhood viewing habits. A side that included such films as The NeverEnding Story, the Black Cauldron, Time Bandits, and the absolutely sobering classic that is Watership Down. Buckle up, kids, because this one's a gut puncher. If you've never seen this before, trust me when I tell you that The Bunny Movie isn't all hippity-hopping and munching on clover. No, somehow a movie with a fair amount of blood, death, and religious commentary made it into the kids' section at your local blockbuster. I suppose that, if anything, that's a testament to America's tendency to lump all animation under the banner of children's media, no matter how brutal and straightforward a film is. And believe me, Watership Down doesn't sugarcoat anything. In fact, it remains remarkably faithful to its original source material, the novel the same name by British author Richard Adams. The medium it's conveyed in be damned. The story follows a group of wild rabbits who, despite living in the wild as rabbits do, are anthropomorphized, having their own society and hierarchical relationships, much like people do. When one of the rabbits, Fiverr, has a precognitive dream about the coming destruction of their warren, a group decides to leave in search of a new home. Fiverr's premonition turns out to be correct, and for the remainder of the film we follow his group, including Hazel, Bigwig, and others, as they journey to a hill known as Watership Down. And what a journey it is. Along the way, everyday dangers whittle down the group's numbers, killing them off both on screen and off. Birds, cats, humans, and even other rabbits put the group in constant peril, and it's genuinely not an easy trip to watch. Their old life in the Warren has left them ill-prepared for the wider world beyond, and their naive natures lead to some pretty harsh moments. The simple ignorance of not knowing what a snare is only to be shown the hard way as the life is choked out of the unfortunate creature caught in it, flies already starting to buzz around them before they're even fully gone. In the end, what remains of the group arrives at Watership Down, but none of them are the same rabbits they were when they left. They, like the viewer, have had the curtain pulled back, the veil lifted. The realities of life, animated or not, are hard lessons to learn. Films like Watership Down helped me learn those lessons in the most stark of terms. I turned out okay. Ralph Bakshi is an acclaimed animator who is regarded as one of the pioneers of modern adult animation. Known for creating such notable works as Fritz the Cat, Heavy Traffic, American Pop, and fantasy features like Wizards, Fire and Ice, and the animated adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. And then there is what is debatably his most infamous work, Coonskin. Loosely based on the Uncle Remus stories, it tells the story of how three brothers took down the systemic corruption of Harlem in order to become the new crime lords of America. Now, when I said that the feature is the most infamous of Bakshi's works, I don't necessarily mean the film itself. Even if the movie doesn't hold back on the shock value and go all out on the stereotypes with no one spared from Ralph's satire in order to present his commentary on racism and corruption in the streets. What is really disturbing about the movie is the events of its premiere and following afterwards on its release. Back then, the most that people knew about it was from promotional material like posters and trailers, and what stood out from them for most people was the use of blackface. For the Congress of Racial Equality and their leader Al Sharpton, that was enough to make the film their enemy, despite no one ever seeing it. They were determined to take Coonskin down at all costs, 
They crashed the premiere with tough questions for Bakshi, protested at Paramount to remove it, and even threw smoke bombs in the theater to get people out from watching it. By the way, if you want to know more about the history of Coonskin and Ralph's other works, I recommend checking out my Animation Look Back series where I chronicle the biography on Ralph Bakshi. As I said before, Ralph did not hold back on how the American system takes advantage of black people, or just people of color in general, and just flat out calls the whole country racist. Keep in mind that this movie was in production at the same time Nixon was president. John Ehrlichman, Nixon's former assistant aide, even admitted that the war on drugs was just a tool that the government used to target protesters of the Vietnam War and black civil rights leaders. This is the history that Coonskin was created in, and unlike some of the others on this list, this is a case where the older this movie is, the more disturbing its message becomes. The movie is almost 50 years old as of this list, and yet, so much of what Bakshi comments about the hidden truth of social structure and racial inequality in that film can apply to the same issues of today. The movie may have been made in the 1970s, but it's frightening how much of that commentary can still be applied to the issues of the 2020s. As the most lighthearted item on our list, the deeply personal and disturbing plot of the clay stop motion film Mary and Max is equally funny as it is depressing. Despite talking about what it's like to live with autism as an adult, or what it's like to deal with depression, neglect, or self esteem issues, there's always a detail that humanizes everything and allows for a moment of dark humor that softens the overall tone. The story follows Mary, an Australian girl with neglectful parents as she sends letters to Max, an autistic, overweight New Yorker. Throughout the course of the film, Mary will ask Max questions that she feels like she can't talk to her own parents about. This is because her dad spends all of his time doing taxidermy and her mom spends all of her time smoking and drinking. Max, on the other hand, does his best to answer. Having Asperger's, he struggles to help this little girl with her social and bullying issues, and even sometimes gets panic attacks when opening up the letters, because it forces him to confront some things that happened in his own past, and it's hard for him to calm down afterwards. This ends up being a hurdle they have to overcome, but they do actually maintain a steady friendship until adulthood. Mary being Max's only friend, and Max being Mary's only remaining family after the loss of her parents. By the way, despite Max not quite having the same form of autism that I have, I do think that Mary and Max is the best representation of autism I've seen in a film. Just by watching this, you can get a good idea for how the disorder works. With that said, now a confident and intelligent young woman with her birthmark surgically removed, Mary attends university to study mental disorders, with her friend Max in mind. When Mary went on to publish her findings, she used Max as a case study and even met critical acclaim. However, being seen as a test subject who's considered defective by his only friend left Max with some hurt feelings. Mary becomes despondent when she realizes how she affected Max, shredding her life's work before falling into a deep depression, which eventually leads to her getting divorced and also leads her into falling into a deep, dark spiral. Max, however, realizes that he needs her in his life as much as she needs him, responding to her apology letter just in the nick of time preventing Mary from hanging herself leading to the birth of her first child. After saving up enough money to visit Max in New York with her newborn baby, it was too late. Max had passed peacefully the morning before her arrival. There, standing in the apartment of the unlikely best friend that she would never get to meet face to face, Mary smiles, knowing that he treasured her and the impact that she had on him. Even though Max had died far too soon for them to share in one another's company, Mary found peace and contentment in the memories she held and clearly loved too. 
Mary and Max both had to find a strength to love themselves despite what other people thought and found that it was easier to do with the help of a friend that they could relate to. Even though their lives had been tough, involving prejudice and heartbreak and unfortunate circumstance, they shouldered their burdens together and accepted those circumstances the way they had been dealt. And I don't know about you, but I feel like there's something inherently beautiful about that. You are my best friend. You are my only friend. Your American pen pal. Max Jerry Horowitz. This one may just be one of the more disturbing on our list for a couple of reasons. Least of all, it's blatant realism. You see, unlike a lot of the more dramatized productions we're talking about today, The Last Day of Freedom distinguishes itself as a tragically true story. This 2015 documentary tells the tale of Manny Babbitt, a man who endured severe mental trauma and PTSD as a result of his Vietnam War service. During a flashback, Manny sadly killed an innocent bystander, an act he has no memory of. Then, despite his decorated military service and well-documented history of mental illness, none of which was brought up at his trial, he was ultimately convicted and executed. And while the film's grim realism may be unsettling enough as it is, the distinctive mix of rough black and white digital art alongside rotoscoped graphite shading gives it the appearance of a bad yet distant memory. Tying the emotional story together is a voiceover provided by Manny's brother, Bill, who lays the entire tragedy bare, eliciting both empathy for the family and outrage at the institutions that failed them. Despite numerous performance issues and mental health examinations, the Marine Corps still decided to ship Manny Babbitt off to Vietnam in 1968. Unfortunately, while he was there, he participated in the brutal Battle of Khe San. Finding himself in one of the most devastating battles of the war did Manny no favors. And like so many others, returning home didn't necessarily mean leaving the conflict behind. Worse still, the post-traumatic stress disorder in Manny went undiagnosed, leaving the Babbitt family puzzled by his odd new behavior and without the resources to get him the help that he needed. Eventually, Manny would come to live with his brother in Sacramento, and it was there, on a foggy December night, that a flashback took hold, and Manny mistook oncoming headlights for an enemy aircraft, only to wake up on a lawn after having stabbed the elderly Leah Schendel to death. And if you think being in Manny's position is frightening, well, you wouldn't want to be in his brother Bill's shoes either. Bill Babbitt was faced with a tough choice, but ultimately decided that he needed to turn Manny into the police, to not only prevent more harm from being done, but to get Manny the care he needed. His reward? A botched trial with a reportedly intoxicated court-appointed lawyer. Manny's fellow Marines who'd served with him in Vietnam were never called to serve as witnesses. Manny's Vietnam medical records weren't even sought out, and ultimately, the sting of an all-white jury sentencing him to death for his crime, which was carried out in 1999. And now, Bill lives with the knowledge that, in trying to help his brother, he also made the decision that sealed his brother's fate in a system badly in need of reform. So, how many uncomfortable realities can you face down in one sitting? Because the last day of freedom touches quite a few, Capital execution. The failings of mental health institutions to provide diagnosis and adequate care to our nation's veterans, and the incredibly painful choices people sometimes have to make in order to get their loved ones proper care. Is it unfair that Manny's fate turned out the way it did? Well, the uncomfortable truth is, the case can indeed be made for just that. And that's a good reason why this story needs to be told. We should be grateful that it was told and that we can still find relevance in its difficult message, even today. Barefoot Gen, made in 1983 and based on the manga by the same name, takes place in Hiroshima at the end of World War II. And you can already tell where we're going with this in regards to what makes this film disturbing. The poster for this movie actually makes it look pretty wholesome, and it even starts out that way, showing us a normal family living their normal lives. That wholesomeness, however, fades away very quickly. 
Gen and his little brother mention many times how hungry they are, and even going so far as to fight over what very little food is left. The scenario is all the more depressing when you hear that the mother is sick from malnutrition while close to giving birth. Barefoot Gen takes its time before the infamous bomb scene. Making sure that we could see the extent of the economic turmoil the Japanese felt before the dropping of the nukes, building tension as we know it's going to happen. It's just only a matter of when. The way this film depicts the bombing of Hiroshima is already gruesome enough, and it's very likely you'll struggle to even continue after watching that. However, that's not where it ends, as it begins to show us the aftermath. We see the effects the bombing had on the survivors in full display, barely clinging to what little life they have left. The radiation effects have on both the environment and the people are shown to us in graphic detail, as black rain begins to fall, water turns into deadly poison, and radiation sickness, something completely unheard of at the time, begins to spread like a plague. Even Gen's family isn't spared from the effects of the blast, as they now struggle to survive more than ever. We hammer in the detail this film presents because, in fact, the creator of the original Barefoot Gen manga, Kenji Nakazawa, was an actual survivor of these very same horrific events. So, when we see those terrifying moments, it was animated by a person with first-hand experience and tried to turn that into something that we many years later can understand. And that's what makes this film so disturbing, yet also what makes it so important. This was a dark chapter in human history, and one that we need to remember through works like these. For only in preserving and remembering parts of our history like this can we hope to never repeat them. Written and directed by Yun Sang Ho, the man also responsible for Train to Busan, perhaps one of the best zombie movies ever made, King of Pigs feels like a film that was personally made for me, and heavily impacted me while researching and watching. Essentially, it's an anti-bullying cautionary tale, and one that would put most PSAs to shame. The child-on-child -child violence feels uncomfortable, yet rooted in reality a reality I've personally seen and been a part of. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Much like most kids, my high school experience was miserable. Two parts mental instability and one part prescription medication that made the experience of trying to relate to other people almost impossible. King of Pigs, on the other hand, is the definition of a disturbing movie. The voiceover feels like it was recorded in a basement at times. <laughs> Like we're taking actual conversations and just recording it, while letting the mics peak as the class of ideology gets more intense. To me, it sells the idea that we're not just watching characters on a screen, but instead we're watching people who are trapped in some sort of hell. The story follows Kyung Min and Jung Suk as adults, while the two reminisce about the events that eventually led to the death of their mutual friend, Kim Chol, a kid who has serious issues that fought back against class structure and the other bullies. By extension, he also did this with violence that only got worse as the film went on. For every kid that gets tormented into withdrawing from academic life altogether, there's an equally cathartic scene where Chol violently puts that bully back in their place. If this was just kids beating the hell out of each other a la Lord of the Flies, then sure, this would be a shocking film. But the thing that continues to scratch at the back of my mind is that the movie implies that the violence is not the result of the kids that were watching being psychopaths or unique in any sense. Instead, King of Pigs frames the violence as a natural response to corrupt politics that the teachers and other students enforce through social structures. There's this one scene in the film that stuck with me, not because it was shocking, but because the scene itself presented this incredibly scary idea. It's where Kyung, Chol, and Jung are in this abandoned clubhouse, and the three have come to the conclusion that in order to get back at the other students, they would have to become bigger, meaner, and scarier than them, resolving to become monsters. So they do so through a rite of passage. After finding a stray cat, the three take turns stabbing it. 
not only to toughen themselves up, but also get a feel for what it's like to stab into something trying to fight back, something that's alive. And it's at that moment that the characters we are watching cease being these middle schoolers, but rather actual monsters. Normally, this would be shocking and pointless, and I would just not care. But the film calls back to this again when Chol pulls a knife on these other students, and it's at that point we know he has absolutely no problems using it. This eventually leads to his expulsion from school and the creation of a new plan. Chol and Jung hate the idea that these rich kids might be able to look back at these moments fondly, so Chol gets a devious idea. He wants to end his own life in front of all the other students during an assembly to curse their memories, to curse the memories of anyone watching, to absolutely ruin any possibility of anyone thinking about this as a good time. As the three discuss, the visuals get sickening, and the characters' appearance start to reflect the evil of the ideas that they are now seriously discussing. Chol is only taken off this dark path when he overhears his mom expressing actual concern for him, making this middle schooler realize that there is more to life than this petty BS, which leads to him eventually trying to convince Jung to change a plan. Instead of ending his own life, Chol would just make a big spectacle and try to use that and the mental instability he's been under to maybe try to get the expulsion reversed. Jung, lacking the insight Chol has, flies into a fit of rage, unable to handle all that hate that's been swelling up during the entirety of the film, leading him to pushing Chol off to his eventual death. The film eventually ends with Kyung Min in present day confronting Jung. Kyung had kept silent and saw the whole thing happen, stating that the only people who don't look back at these times fondly is him and Jung. In the end, wishing Jung a better life and hoping that he could find some happiness moving forward, doing the one thing Chol couldn't do on his own, Kyung ends his life by jumping off the roof of the school, far too damaged by the right to continue living a dull life. The film ends with Jung calling his girlfriend who he's been ignoring throughout the entirety of the movie. Make no mistake, this is a miserable story that will honestly leave you feeling hollow once it's over. It's also an experience I'm glad I had. King of Pigs takes a look at what makes a good kid go bad and how that affects them growing up. Considering the rise of real world violence, especially at schools, the conclusion of this film is not only horrifying, but also the most disturbing one on this list. So while finishing up the last entry on this list, almost by pure chance, I got autoplayed from the Agretzico Christmas special into this 12 minute heart wrenching film that focuses on the trauma a family goes through when losing a child. Due to an unforeseen delay with this video, we have decided to add If Anything Happens, I Love You to our list. Written and directed by Will McCormick and Michael Govier, this short, quiet, animated film depicts the horrors of coming home to an empty house after losing your kid to the only real threat that no parent could ever hope to stop on their own. Personally, after watching and covering so many scams and conspiracy theories that focus on the idea that you can profit off the pointless loss of life of children, seeing this animated short specifically showing what that first night home might have been like really broke me. Every emotion and unspoken thought is shown wordlessly through facial expression, body posing, and visual surrealism. In just 12 minutes, we get to see the life of this family and their child through both the good and unfortunately the bad, which in my opinion honestly takes some serious talent. In all honesty, the autoplay robbed me of a description for this animation, so while watching, I had to learn that their child was lost, why they were so distraught, and then it hit me unexpectedly hard when I saw this scene.
The film then ending on those infamous words. If anything happens, I love you. Here's some facts about the reality of the situation. 72% of marriages end after the death of a child. A sizable portion of the United States don't even think these tragedies even exist, and several of our own congressmen perpetuate this idea. The damage done is irreparable, and my heart goes out to the victims. I'm sorry this is the reality we live in, and I'm glad that animations like this exist to give us perspective on something so evil and unknowable. My only hope is that through animations like this and some of the others on this list that we all can get a bit of empathy and learn from each other's shared experiences, which is really what this art form is all about. The film If Anything Happens, I Love You does just this by helping communicate some incredibly complex feelings in a short 12 minute animation, which you can find right now on Netflix. Hey, it looks like you made it to the end of yet another really long video. I'd like to apologize for not uploading in four months. Honestly, I don't even have an excuse, it's just depression and creator burnout. But now that I've been gone for four months, I feel like I'm ready to come back to this at more full force. So be expecting some new cool stuff coming on down the road. I'm kind of thinking worse YouTubers. Now, with that out of the way, I'd like to thank the Patreon people that actually makes this possible. Not only does the Patreon help me afford rent, but it also goes towards making the completely original soundtrack, which we're going to be releasing our first album here pretty soon. Plus, without Patreon, it would be a lot harder for me to pay the writers and editors that also make this possible. With that said, I'd like to thank Ali Elman, The True Vaporwave, and Depression for their donation of $100. Wow, I, I'm absolutely amazed that so many people would be willing to help me at that level. Uh, at $75, we have Tara Workman. At $50, we have Willow Firefox and William Hyatt. Again, you guys are nuts. Uh, thank you. And at $20, we have Seuss Barty. At 15, Giblet. The, the rest should be either on screen or I couldn't fit you guys in this time. By the way, I've made a post on Patreon about this, but I now have a new Discord server that's exclusive basically to anyone who's ever been generous enough to donate to the channel at any point. Just because you stop donating doesn't mean I'm going to kick you out. And basically what we're going to do there is have game nights. We have a list of games there that we play. And also we're going to be viewing the video early, which is what we did with this very video. So if you ever donated, feel free to email me or message me on Discord. I My public server has me there. I'm, my DMs are open pretty much all the time. And yeah. Now, before I go, I also want to say that Animat was a huge help with the video, and I've been a fan of his content for a while, so it was really a dream come true working with him. You can find him linked in the end card. And with that said, I'm your host, that Creepy Reading, and I'm signing off to get some sleep.